My parents were missionaries. They were Lutheran missionaries. Augustana Synod Mission it was, a, it was a branch of the Lutheran Church then, but mainly of Swedish, of Sw Swedish origin. My my father immigrated from Sweden when he was 16 years old, and my mother's parents had come from Sweden also. And they all settled in New Haven, Connecticut, where my mother grew up. And my early, I had an older sister when I, two and a half years older than me, when I was, when I was born in Sichang. And my earliest, earliest memories are of our, we, we were living in Rujo, uh, a mission station in the western part of the western highlands of Honan, uh, abandoned infested area, so it was a little touch and go there. But I do remember my myself and my friend Reuben Lundin, both four years old, uh, bicycling on tri tricycling rather on the, the brick the brick sidewalks in our missionary compound. The, missionary co the mission compound was surrounded by walls so they were protected from, uh, from, peop from, from just incursions there. Anyway, uh, we, I remember pushing up my little brother and, 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 and Ruben's little brother Milton off on their Kitty cars off the sidewalks to get out of our way. That's all I can remember about it. The only other memories I have of that time. Oh, I know that uh, that my my parents have told me that uh, they came, they went home on furlough. They they had a furlough every seven years. They were due a furlough every seven years, and they went home on furlough in 1923. They had gone to China in 1914, and. Uh, I could only speak Chinese at that time. I was three years old, spoke only Chinese, because I only played with Chinese kids, and I had a Chinese nurse maid. Uh, we called Dada. Her Chinese name was Liu Sao, and uh, she was a wonderful elderly lady. But my parent, my grandparents, we we visit, we stayed with in New Haven, Connecticut, had to learn a little Chinese to to communicate with me. I would be shouting, Wa Yao Shui, Wa Yao Nai, I want, I want water, I want milk. <clears throat> and they, they learned the basic vocabulary. But <clears throat> by the time I was ready to go back to China, I'd forgotten all my Chinese and spoke only English. So uh, that, that's the last time I <clears throat> really was fluent in Chinese. Then in 1927, uh, there was a major uh, armed conflict in our area between the forces of Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek was leading from the south, he was trying to unify China, and the northern warlords. The warlords dominated various regions of North China, and they resisted this uh, movement. We were caught in between that. I can remember some some fighting in our area, uh, and I we were sent back to America by the by the uh, the consul consul general Hancock, U.S. consul general ordered all Americans out of that part of China, so we came back as a refugees in the, from Shanghai in the U.S.S. Pierce a dollar liner, and we were all in the steerage. We each had a, a, a big four-poster bed, which w w would contain one family with uh, uh, curtains around it, and that was the way we traveled, which was nice. So then we stayed in the United States for, not not all of us, but uh, uh, m m my mother and us sat back for a while. Uh, in first in New Haven, Connecticut, where our parents, where our grand, where my mother's parents were, and then when my dad came back from China for a while, was sent back again. Uh, we moved to Mabel, New York, where he took uh, charge of a parish. He had three parishes there 
in western New York, the, f the furthest, it was on Chautauqua Lake, the Chautauqua County, the, the most western most county in New York, just south of the Lake Erie. And there I spent, oh, let's see, 19, 20, five years of my life, from age nine to age 14. Uh, and I enjoyed that. It was, uh, we lived in a big white frame parsonage, went to school there, and had a taste of American childhood. I went to Luther College in Wahoo, Nebraska. It was a small junior college. It was a good transi transition place because in many ways it was very much like a ASK. There was no dancing. Uh, there were Saturday night games like in which the boys and girls would get together for it. And, uh, and, and it was a pretty low-keyed place, mostly farm kids from around uh, Nebraska and South Dakota. And uh, I had two enjoyable years there, developed some close friendships. One of my best friends uh, was from there. Uh, and, and, we, and I graduated from it because it was a two-year school. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and decided to go to Augustana College. That was in 1939. Augustana was a four-year school, Lutheran also, in Rock Island, Illinois. Let me just digress a moment to say, when I was at Luther, when I came to Luther, I'd, I'd said that I was going to go into chemical engineering, but I had no idea what chemical engineering was like. I hadn't had, I hadn't had any chemistry at that time. But I had a, a feeling for science anyway. And uh, I took chemistry at Luther, and we had an old teacher, S.O. Johnson, who, who doubled as groundskeeper, by the way. And uh, the first thing we had to do in, in the chemistry lab was to empty the Democrats out of our test tubes. Democrats were box elder bugs. Uh, Democrats were rare at that time in, in Nebraska. so. These bugs got named Democrats. Uh, well, I, I, after about a year of that, I decided I wasn't, you know, chemistry wasn't, I was terribly homesick for China for one thing. I loved it there and I wished I could go back. I didn't want to be a minister like my dad. Oh, well, that's what my dad wanted me to be. Uh, so the next thing that would get me back to China would be becoming a doctor. So this is how I be, decided to, be, to go for medicine. I became a pre-med then, and uh, with, the, with the aim of going back to China as a missionary. And I continued that at Augustana. Well, I liked it at Augustana, but it was a more sophisticated school. There was a lot of dancing went on there. I learned how to dance for the first time. And uh, a certain amount of drinking, which I had, I was quite shocked at, I might say, uh, never having encountered it before. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, it was a good sound science school there too, which I, I appreciated because it gave me a good background in chemistry and mathematics, which were my twin, uh, twin majors. So after four years of college, I, had, I, applied, I applied for the me medical school. I came up to, I decided to go to Minnesota because my closest relatives, my dad's brother, Uncle, Uncle Ben, as we called him, uh, was, uh, uh, lived here. He was founder of the Benson Optical Company, which was a, a prominent op optical company. Now has gone, become defunct, I think. Uh, and uh, so I decided to go, to go there and applied and was admitted and started in the fall of 1941. In 1941, my, my parents came home from China on, on a sabbatical. They'd been there for eight years, one year more than they needed. And my brother, brothers, three brothers came home then too. And uh, so the family got together and we, we rented a house right near where we live right now on 31st in Fremont. And I've gone past that house and thought about it those days. And that's where I started out in medical school. I worked very hard the first year. I, 
I uh, had a, 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 a bedroom by myself in our big, in, our big, in, in the back of it, oh, and it was really a sun porch overlooking the backyard, and I, and I studied like everything there because I was overwhelmed by the size of the university, and most of my uh, classmates had gone to the university and were, felt at home there, you know, everything. So I was quite odd. But by the end of the year, they, those days, they, they would post our, our class rankings. They wouldn't do that anymore, of course. Post our class rankings at the end of the year. And to my surprise, and, and, and uh, surprise of my classmates, I think, too, I came out third in the class of 120 students. So I, st I learned a lesson that if you establish yourself at the beginning, you get off for a good start, you know, you're, you have uh, won half the battle because from then on, the, the, uh, I had a reputation in the medical school as being a, a good scholar. They didn't, I expect many of my classmates thought I was quite a grind too, because I really was. I didn't, I didn't really socialize. I, I joined a, a fraternity because I thought that was the thing to do. Five guys, it turned out to be one of the most uh, party-loving ones. <laughs> it, was, it was a good experience for me. Before, not a good social uh, person I began to become more social. Anyway, um, the other experience that I remember from the first year was sitting in an anatomy class. This was in a big uh, auditorium in uh, uh, Jackson Hall. And we sat according to uh, our alphabetic, alphabetic <laughs> the, the A's and B's would be in the front and C's and so forth. And uh, one day we had a, a surgeon lecturing to us about the, the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, he was drawing on the board. And they were always, always very good drawers. Uh, and, he, and he asked, uh, would somebody uh, come down and show us how, where the duct of Santorini runs? And I looked around to see who was going to go down. Nobody did. So I, got, I hopped over the railing and went down and drew it. And he thanked me. He said, that's just absolutely right. And I enjoyed medical school, and I made lifelong friendships there. I think I enjoyed the clinical years more than the basic science, but I enjoyed the basic science Years too. I enjoyed pathology under Dr. Bell. He was a great teacher. And I had many other teachers that were great. Uh, Professor Downey, who became one of the leaders of, in, the, in, in worldwide hematology, uh, taught us histology. And we had some very distinguished teachers at the university then. And looking back on it, we realized that that was kind of a golden age, that school hadn't grown too big. Teachers spent more time teaching. We'd be more, we'd have more contact with the, with the professors rather than just the instructors and assistant professors and residents. I enjoyed the clinical years. And, and because of the war was going on, well, we were taken about, about a year, two and a half, we uh, had the choice of going into one of the services to keep us from being drafted. So many medical students were being drafted by desperate draft boards who were, were really getting hard up for draftees, uh, that the services decided to put us in the service to keep us from getting drafted. So we could elect either the Navy or the Army. There was no Air Force at that time. Uh, and I like, because I, I had a problem with seasickness. I decided I'd better go in the Army, so I did. And we were, we, we were made, I think, private PFCs we were. It was so-called Army's ASTP, Army Service Training Program. We really didn't have to do anything except go, go to school and wear our uniforms. We didn't have any drill or anything like that. And uh, so if I ever met an officer, I, I tried to salute him the best I could. But uh, that saved us, and saved me financially, too, because instead of uh, me having to pay tuition, the Army paid my tuition, 
and uh, even I even got a small stipend every month. It was quite a change for me. And uh, uh, I had the obligation to go into the Army for at least two years as a medical officer when I had completed at least one, at least my medical school and an internship. So I graduated from medical school. We were on an accelerated program, got through, went through the summers, got through in three years, graduated in September of 1944. My mother came up from uh, Rock Island to, for the occasion, which I, really touched me because it wasn't easy for her to do that. My father had gone back to China by that time and was in West China somewhere with China Relief. I went from there to Cincinnati uh, for my internship at Cincinnati General Hospital. Uh, I, it was for a year, or not, not quite a year, about nine months, from September to July of 1944, September 1944, July 1945. And then I had to go into the Army as a medical officer after that. Uh, that was a good year at internship. I liked Cincinnati. I liked the internship. I liked internal medicine particularly. And uh, uh, I, I did get psychiatry, which uh, qualified me to be a psychiatrist in the Army, actually. When, when they saw that I had psychiatry, they assigned me to a psychiatric unit. But I'd only had six, six weeks of it. But I, I, that was one of the best parts of it because the psychiatry department at Cincinnati was excellent, and the department here was very weak at Minnesota at that time, in my judgment anyway. And I learned a lot of psychiatry, and I, I won't relate all the experiences I had, but at least I, I enjoyed those, those six weeks more than I thought. I wasn't very happy about having it in the first place, but because uh, I had no interest in it, but I developed some interest. And I also had dermatology, which I didn't particularly want either, but it was good also. Uh, after a stint at Fletcher General Hospital in Cambridge, Ohio, which is an orthopedic hospital, uh, I, and where I was, was impressed by the men that came in back from the Far East, many of them with quite, quite severe injuries. Uh, uh, most, this was orthopedic, so they were mostly uh, leg and, and arm injuries. And much, many had to have prostheses. Uh, and I developed, well, I've got to go in, I've got to go to the Far East. And I, my orders, my new orders were to report to a, 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 a port of embarkation, a POE, to, for the Far East, who would take part in the invasion of Japan. But of course, that all came to an end when the bombs were dropped, and instead our orders were changed, and we were sent. I, all the, the A's and the first part of the B's were sent to Massachusetts. The next B's were sent to New York, New Jersey, and the ones with W and on were out on the West Coast. It was all by, by alphabetic order. And so I went to Fort Devens in Massachusetts, which was a separation center, and that's where I got pronounced a psychiatrist because I had, I was probably one of the only ones that had any psychiatry training uh, post-MD at all. But I didn't enjoy that so much, and I managed to get uh, transferred to another unit after a few weeks. Uh, and I, I applied for overseas to the Far East, but in, in May of of 1946, I got to send to, to Germany instead by way of France and was assigned to a, a uh, engineering unit, the 343rd Engineer as battalion surgeon. And uh, that was an interesting experience because this, this unit had, had companies all over the occupied zone of China, of China, of Germany of Germany, and uh, so uh, my job was to visit these various ones and see how, how well they were being cared for by the local clinic or unit, whatever it was, and examine their mess 
and examined their VT, VD detachment. They all had a VD. What happened when, the, when they developed VD, which was quite often, was that they were assigned to a special detachment, which where they had to work harder. And I didn't think that was a good idea. How were they going to get over it? I mean, that was before penicillin still, you know, too. I mean, penicillin was just coming in, in fact. Uh, so anyway, those were interesting experiences. But So nobody knew where I was most of the time. My driver and I were on the road or someplace, uh, pretty much on my, my own. Uh, and I went to the Nuremberg, uh, one of our companies was in Nuremberg, so I had a chance to 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 attend the Nuremberg trials, which was, were very interesting. And I had very, very many other interesting experiences, but finally, uh, they grounded me, so to speak, at the f first first company's quarters. It was assigned to Hanau, Germany, just just east of Frankfurt on the Main River, and uh, there I uh, uh, was was in charge of a clinic. Actually, uh, I had a, I had a, one assistant MD. Who, I was I'd become a captain by that time. My assistant was a, was a first lieutenant. And a, and a dentist, uh, Lieutenant Dana. And so uh, I was there for the last six months of my time in Germany. And it was there I met my wife, Anne. Uh, and I saw Anne first at the, at the uh, Auschwitz Club. And there weren't very many young American women over there, let's say. And I remember asking my partner, who's that young woman? Oh, that's Mr. Bransetter's daughter. Oh, hmm. Well, in a little while, her, her, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bransetter invited me, uh, invited me over to, to, to check on her aunt Anne for, uh, had a bad cold, and she'd had rheumatic fever, so they were always a little bit more worried about her. And so I did, and then a little bit later, I asked her for a date. <laughs> it was not uh, correct protocol in for the physician, you're not supposed to make dates with your with, your, with your, any patients. That was wrong, but I it wasn't really a date. I asked her to go to a movie with me, and she and her younger sister came to a movie. At any rate, we became engaged, and uh, when I found out what happened was when I found out I was going to have to I was going to go home in May, I I quickly applied for residencies at home and. I applied to Cincinnati for a residency in internal medicine. I applied for a re for a residency in internal medicine at Minnesota under Dr. Watson, and uh, and as an afterthought, I applied for a residency in pathology with Dr. Bell because I decided if I didn't get one of the others, spending Dr. Watson had always said spending a, some a year in pathology was a true tremendously good basis for med for internal medicine. So I got a response from Cincinnati that I was turned down there. I mean, they'd already filled all their positions. And uh, I didn't hear anything from Minnesota, but I got a quick response from Dr. Bell offering me a residency in pathology at Veterans Hospital for $3,300 a year. And I thought, oh my God, that much money? Boy, that's something. So I wrote back and accepted that. Later, I heard from internal medicine was accepted there too, but I let Dr. Watson know I was going to spend some time in pathology, and he told me that, oh, that's fine, LSU. You let us know when you, when you want to switch to internal medicine, you'll have a position here, which was nice. Uh, Ann and I got married. Then I, that made me say, say, you know, I need to get married. <laughs> I'd had a lot of girlfriends, but it was time to 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 settle down, and and Anne and I had become close friends. We we hadn't had we weren't uh, uh, we weren't romantic at the time. We were just friends, gone to dances together and various other things. And I decided to ask her if she'd marry me. I remember walking on a road there between. Uh, Linda now, which was uh, the ba the place where I was, my bachelor quarters were, and her Gross Auerheim, where her her home was in a group of of homes for dependents. And popping the question to her, and she 
And well, you know, Alice, I like you a lot, but I, I've got other plans. I'm going to go to art school for one thing when I graduate. And I want to go, she hadn't graduated from high school yet. She was just going to graduate. Uh, and I, I have to put that ahead of getting married. I said, well, okay. I don't know whether I can wait for you because I am, <laughs> very frank, because I'm eager to get married now. Anyway, the next night she, well, I went home and I kind of reviewed my options there and I decided I wasn't going to do anything. But uh, I got a call from her the next night saying that she'd changed her mind. Her mother had, had talked to her about it and said, you know, and you'll not, probably not get a better, better offer than that. You better reconsider it. So she, she said, uh, yes, I will, I will marry you. I've, I've decided that. And so I said, fine, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get married then here and then go home. And I've, it's made me feel that arranged marriages aren't so bad after all. <laughs> anyway, we've, we've been married almost 60 years now. It'll be 60 years next spring. And we've had a wonderful marriage. Anyway, our, our engagement and wedding was the big social event of the military community there that, that year, I remember that. Uh, there were parties, and we, there was an, uh, a dance celebrating our engagement at the Officers Club, and Colonel Benson formally announced, and, and Carol Branstetter, daughter of Lyman and Ellen Branstetter, is engaged to be married to Captain Ellis Benson, <laughs> and so forth. <laughs> very, very formal, you know. And we were we we had two two marriage ceremonies. I would say the official one was with the Burgomeister in Frankfurt. That was the only one that the the German government recognized. So uh, we uh, that means me, I, and Anne, and, and Mr. and Mrs. Branstetter went there for this. And it was just a ceremony, very formal. And then three days later, we we had a, ch a church wedding at a little chapel in uh, Hanau, crammed with 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 officers and men and there were some dependents. Uh, that was a regular uh, church ceremony that the chaplain Fine performed. Chaplain Fine was the local chaplain, a Baptist. Uh, and and of course, uh, I I didn't see anything of Anne between the three, the 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 two ceremonies and two days because her mother was was quite de definite that we couldn't be together at all until uh, the church ceremony had taken place. So anyway, that was that story. Then we went to we went to Paris on our honeymoon, which was nice. Army paid our way and all. It went by train. And Paris was recovering from the war. This was April 47, two years after, about two years after VE Day. And uh, it still was a, a, a nice place, gay. We, we stayed at the Ambassador Hotel, very cheap. It had been taken over by the Army. Uh, and we, we went to the the Lido and the Valais Berger and started again and saw that and just had an enjoyable week in Paris. And then we proceeded to uh, Bremerhaven to take uh, an army boat home. We, I went to Chicago to be separated from the army and then we went to Minneapolis to start a residency. And we, we managed to sublet a apartment downtown on 12th Street and La Salle. And it was a hot summer of 1947, one of the hottest they'd had for, for a while. And they didn't have air conditioning. So some nights we had to sleep out on the, on the lawn behind the, the, that apartment building on the corner of 12th and La Salle. You can imagine doing that these days, sleeping outside. No, I don't think so. Anyway. Uh, I um, started to see then in July 1947 in pathology, and uh, there were two of us that started together, Doug, Don Gleason, who was a classmate of mine, and I. 
And uh, uh, Don, after, uh, uh, later that summer, said to me, Ellis, why don't we buy a double bungalow? We, we've, we found one for sale uh, that looks pretty good together and uh, we save on rent and so forth. And uh, I never thought about buying a, a house. I never, my parents had never owned a house. I had never lived, lived in that kind of situation. But I had saved enough money from poker playing <laughs> in Germany. My parents didn't know that though. They, my mother just thought Ellis is very, yeah, Ellis is very, being very prudent and saving money well from his army pay. So I had, I had over $2,000 in the bank and I used that for a down payment on this uh, house at 5118, 5120 Chicago Avenue, just off the parkway. It was a lovely spot actually. We were like, we, it cost us only the combined, I mean, we paid 17500 for it between the two of us. So it was about 8000 and something each. And so then I embarked on my career as a pathologist and uh, uh, was in pathology. Then after one year of pathology at Vets, Dr. Bell said to us, and he, he belatedly in his career had decided that that it was a good idea to train in clinical pathology because that was becoming important out in the practice of pathology. So he said, one of you has got to go into clinical pathology next year, and the other one will stay in anatomic pathology. So you decide how that will be done. And I remember this scene of the chief resident at Vets, Walter Subby, flipping a coin see which one was going to go do what. And that's how careers are started, I guess, because I, I went on into clinical pathology laboratory medicine and spent my whole career in it, really. And Don had a distinguished career in anatomic pathology where he became internationally known for developing a system for histologically uh, grading uh, carcinoma of the prostate. The Gleason, when I was, when I attended conferences in Europe, I found that the Gleason system was used there, that uh, people when they were talking about uh, carcinoma of the prostate would say, well, it, it turned out to be a Gleason 7 and so forth. So Don had really succeeded in his area and he, he, he went on to become chief of pathology at, at Veterans and late, later at Fairview uh, Riverside. But he's a great guy too. Uh, anyway, I I finished my two years in pathology and went and, and then asked to go into internal medicine. So I did, and I was at Vets under doc, Dr. Ebert, who was a wonderful teacher too. And I was just enjoying a great deal when I got a call from from Dr. G. T. Evans, and I'd spent that year in clinical pathology with Dr. Evans. It was. Lab, uh, it was called laboratory medicine, and uh, and he was in charge of it, and it was part of the Department of Medicine. So I got this call, saying, "Alice, I have a opening for an instructor at forty six hundred dollars a year. Would you be interested in it?" And I tell, uh, I said, "Well, I think so. I'll talk to Ann about it and let you know tomorrow." And I went home and talked with Ann, went over with Ann, and I had I'd been thinking I'd go into internal medicine, and go out to North Dakota to practice. I, I did. There's no way I could get back to China now because the communists had closed the way entirely. And uh, she was game to do that, uh, but and she but she was willing to to go this route and see see what see how it was. So that's how I got into laboratory medicine, and I've stayed there ever since. Well, I soon realized that I liked laboratory medicine a lot. Laboratory medicine at that time was made up of uh, several divisions, only four really when I started, and that was chemistry, microbiology, hematology, and blood banking. And I, I elected really to, to concentrate on chemistry but Dr. Benz, Dr. Evans, 
assigned me to be director of blood banking, I said to Dr. Evans, I don't know any, Jerry, I don't know anything about blood banking. So you, you, you don't need to know anything about it to, the med techs will take care of it. Well, I learned a lot about blood banking as director and it was kind of, kind of enjoyable. I can't tell you all the experience that I had, but I'll give you one illustration that uh, Dr. Wangenstein, who was a great surgeon, but very adventuresome and aggressive as a surgeon too, and he was embarked on a program in which he was trying to cure cancer, no matter how extensive it was, by surgery. And of course it took large quantities of blood. And one, and not infrequently, we'd run out of blood. And, and uh, I closed the blood bank and notified the residents of that. And there, I said, you better let Dr. Weinstein know. No, we, we, we can't t tell Dr. Weinstein that, Dr. Benson. You'll have to do that yourself. So I went up on the uh, wards to find Dr. Ab Dr. Wangenstein. And he was making rounds on his patients. It was a big coterie of nurses, uh, uh, junior staff people, residents, medical students around him. And I let him know that. And he said, D Dr. Benson, you are a doctor, aren't you? <laughs> so, yeah, an MD? Yes, I am, Dr. Wangenstein. Um, don't you realize we can't close the blood bank? We have lives to save. You don't realize that, do you? I said, well, listen, Dr. Wangenstein, we'd love to, we want, don't want to close the blood bank, but we run totally out of blood, both here and the ones that we can get from St. Paul and Minneapolis. So we have to close it until we get restocked. He, he shook his head and said, um, I don't think you can be a real doctor. <laughs> anyway, uh, I actually became a good friend of Augustine as time went by and admired him a lot. The only other uh, things that I want to emphasize in those days, that was the, in the, uh, well, I started in the, in, fine in the department, but that was mainly in the 50s, was the great push in, in open heart surgery by Lilla and Varco. That was very exciting. And I, and the blood bank was very much, uh, involved in it. Fortunately, the, the, the regular blood bank uh, 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 director, Dr. Ziegler, had come back from sick leave and could take over, but I still get, got involved quite a bit. But it was interesting, too. And then in, uh, then I went to Denmark in 19, I, I decided that I needed more training for, re we were expected to do research take care of patients and teach, be triple threats, so to speak, in those days. And uh, I was trying to build up a research program and I felt that I needed more, more training and, and research. And so I was on a uh, National Institutes of Health um, uh, Research Career Development Award, which I had received. And on the basis of that, I, I was able to go to Denmark, bring my whole family along for a year to work with Dr. Professor Lindstrom Lang at Carlsberg Laboratory there. That was a, a world, world center for protein chemistry. And it, was, it changed my life in many ways because Dr. Uh, Professor Wong, uh, Lindstrom Lang was a wonderful teacher and a really fine scientist. And, well, I'd had a lot of formal training in chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, I still, and mathematics too, and I still had not had the basic training in laboratory science research type that I needed. But I received it that year, and that marked me on a career that lasted me the rest of my life, the rest of my academic life. Uh, so that, and it was a wonderful year for our family too because we were able to spend more time together. Uh, we had more t time available. I didn't have any administrative duties. It was great. And it, then in uh, in uh, 19, I uh, began to get offers from other, from other schools at that time. I remember Dr. Dr. I told Dr. Evans when I came back from 
from Denmark that, you know, Jerry, my, uh, there was there was seven uh, uh, scientists from America at the lab with me, all about my age, uh, from different schools, and I had about the lowest salary of all of them. <laughs> I don't think that's fair. So he said, well, we can't do anything about it, Alice, unless you get offers from uh, other schools. I said, well, that's, I said to myself, that's ridiculous. I, I'm either good or I'm not, whether I get offers or not. Anyway, it wasn't long before I got an offer from the University of Washington, which was in the Department of Biochemistry, by the way, which was nice. Uh, and and they, I visited out there, beautiful school, a wonderful place. Uh, the the um, offer, the, sal the firm offer, the salary and all, was... Uh, uh, Seventy percent higher than what I was getting in Minnesota, so I came back to to tell Dr. Evans about that, which which caused a good increase in my salary, not to the seventy percent, but still a good increase. And so I stayed at Minnesota, and then I did get offers from uh, other places too. But uh, my most important one was in, to Chicago, and the University of Chicago was after me to to head up clinical pathology there. Uh, in 1962, 63, and I almost went. I told him that, I, that by the end of February, that, uh, that I would I would make a final decision, and I was leaning on going. But Dr. Evans wanted me to stay, but uh, I didn't get any uh, inkling that there was any good reason for staying, because that was a very attractive offer, a great a great institution. I wasn't too eager to move to Chicago <laughs> with uh, the kids and all that, but and we loved it here in Minnesota. But anyway, as a result of that, well, Dr. Dr. Robert Good, who was a good friend of both Jerry and me, uh, took me out for lunch one day and said, "You know, uh, Alice, you really don't want to go to Chicago, do you?" "Well, yes, I do. I'm all I'm all set to go." Anyway, he tried to talk me out of it, and pretty soon I got. Um, uh, a call from the dean. Uh, a told me, he told me that the, the president of the university was was going to send me a letter uh, that, saying that I would be the new, new when Jerry retired, which Jerry, Jerry was getting close to retirement age. When Jerry retired, I would be the the uh, head of laboratory medicine. Well, I was at. Uh, that, that was one of the reasons I was going. I was so uncertain as to what would happen when Jerry when Jerry retired. So uh, that kind of settled that, and I decided to stay here and became head of, of laboratory medicine in uh, in April 1966 when Jerry formally retired and moved to British Columbia for his retirement. He went back to his home in, in British Columbia, and. Uh, so I became head of laboratory medicine, and I joined that. And in 1970, I went to Rome on, on sabbatical this time. I took a year sabbatical. I felt I needed some further training. And I went to a good laboratory in Rome in biochemistry and embarked on a career of, of research in, in hemoglobin. Before that, I'd been working on muscle proteins, but uh, I started on a program on hemoglobin, which led me into a lot of interesting areas. And uh, it was a great year in, in Rome, too. Uh, Anne didn't like it as much as I did, because she felt more isolated in a way there. Uh, two, our two daughters came along, but uh, even so, uh, she wasn't as happy as I was. But uh, then in 1973, oh, I should say that backtracking a little bit. In 1965, a group of us met, a group of people in this field met in Bethesda, Maryland and at NIH and founded the Society of Academic, uh, the Academy of Clinical Pathology, no, the Academy of Clinical Laboratory Physicians and Scientists, or so-called ACLIPS. Uh, I was one of the five member people that that uh, founded the society, and uh, it was for people in laboratory medicine 
in academic laboratory medicine all over the country. Of course, it, there were quite a few people that joined it right away. I, I was elected president for a year. The first meeting was in Portland, Oregon. and I was elected president at the meet, at, at an organizational meeting that took place after that in Bethesda. And our first annual meeting was in Portland. And it became a very important part of my life and of academic medicine. Then in 1970, I went to Rome on that sabbatical, as I said, and I got a call asking me to become a, mem a, a member of the American Board of Pathology. But I told them that I was going to Rome for a year. They said, oh, we're, okay, well, we'll, we'll s hold it off and you, you can start next year. So I did become a member, a uh, trustee, as they call it, of the American Board of Pathology in 19, actually in 1970, but was on leave for a year and was, was a member of the board for 12 years. This is the board that certifies pathologists and, and, and not only pathology, but the subspecialties of pathology. It was a good experience, it took a lot of time, but it was, it was important. And I became president of the, of the board in 1981 and 82. Uh, I became, uh, in, in 1973, Dr. Good, who had become, been appointed in fact, I was the chairman of the search committee that selected him, become uh, head of pathology at succeeding Dr. Dawson, who had retired at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and in 1970, he, he, became, he became head in 1970, just as I was going to, to uh, Rome. And in 19, but in 1973, he decided to go to New York to take a position as, as president and uh, head of the Sloan Kettering Institute, a big, a big research institute de dedicated to cancer, which is his area of interest in New York. And at that time, the, uh, the search committee at Minnesota asked me whether I would be willing to become head of pathology as well. Uh, and combine the two, try to merge the two, laboratory medicine and pathology, into one department. And so I took that on against uh, my wife. Didn't think it was a good idea because I was kind of over, over committed already and take on that. But I, I could see that it was a challenge. Pathology was an indulgence, but Dr. Good had done one good thing for it. He'd gotten more space and more research funds into the department. So it was more attractive than it had been before. I, I, they, they, they had uh, sounded me out about it uh, in, in 1970, but I was, I was, and, but I, I was willing to be chairman of the search committee, but not be head of pathology at that time. But in 1973, I took it on and merged the two departments into the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. It's interesting, it's the only Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology in the, department, in the country, but it, it, it signified that laboratory medicine was the strongest department here, <laughs> stronger than pathology at that time. But of course, my major job there was to, to strengthen pathology, and so I went out searching. I enjoyed, I enjoyed uh, recruitment and uh, searching for a new, for, for, for a, one of the things that the search committee laid on me was that you have to improve surgical pathology because it was dependent on only one man who was a very good guy, Paul Lober, but it was too much for him to do. He couldn't, he couldn't teach residents and, and do the work. He could just barely do the work and the surgeons were talking about recruiting their own surgical pathologists. So anyway, I went out and I was lucky enough to get Dr. Rasai from Washington University and Dr. Daner from there, who transformed, helped me transform that uh, part of the department from one of the worst in the United States to one of the top. And so I felt I left the department when I retired in 1989 as department head, stayed on for a year as a professor.
in good shape, and it, it was a tra an attractive chair when when I left, and some of the top people of the country were interested in it. And and uh, I mean, my friends from Harvard and University of Pennsylvania, who I'd gone on on site visits with, told me, you know, Ellis, when you retire, you have to realize you're your uh, department is probably the strongest department in the United States now. Which made me feel very good, you know, that at least I would accomplished something. And it's partly due to the fact that laboratory medicine had, had developed strong, a strong basis before it united with pathology, so that we were way ahead of a lot, most other institutions in that regard. And that's, that, that made it attractive to people like Ron, Juan Rasai and Daner too, because they could see that it was a growing into a very strong department. And anyway, I enjoyed my my last 16 years at the university as as head of the combined department. Had very good faculty, proud of them and loved them. And and I was glad that Lou. The Leo was picked to be the new. In fact, he was the one that I recommended for the job, and the, and the search committee finally decided on him, and he's done a terrific job. As I knew he would be a good department head, that he had the right tools for that, and uh, probably better than me. I think I'm. I was more of a person, a people person than Leo has been, but Leo has got so much on the ball, and has so much. To, uh, to, uh, a vision and and uh, and ability, and he's such a good scientist, much better scientist than I ever was, that he has uh, has become a real leader in the field, and I'm proud of that. Medicine is a way of life. You have to take that into account. It's not just a, a call, a, a vocation, or a calling. It's your whole life is going to be wrapped up in it. And you have to be sure that that you put the patient first. The first, the most important thing in your life is going to be taking taking care of patients as a, as a, a physician. And so you have to realize those two things. And you have to have thirdly, as as Oster pointed out, a quality called equanimitas. In other words, be able to to have personal tragedies occur without them de deflecting you from taking care of the patients that, you, that are in your charge. You have to be totally committed to the care of your patients and they put them before everything else.